Please join me in welcoming our next speaker, Dr. Scott Major. Dr. Major got his PhD in chemical engineering from the University of California, Davis. Currently, he is a staff scientist in the process science and engineering group within the chemistry and the nanoscience center at NREL. His research focuses on the science and engineering of road to road coding processes for manufacturing. Most of his work focuses on fuel cells and electrolyzers, including work as part of the U.S. Department of Energy, Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Technology Office, Million Mile Fuel Cell Truck, and H2 New Consortia. Today, he's going to talk about understanding catalyst agglomeration for water electrolyzer manufacturing. Welcome, Dr. Major. All right, thank you. Thanks for the introduction. Thanks for everyone for joining today. Uh, yeah, so you know, the title of my talk is Understanding Catalyst Agglomeration for Water Electrolyzer Manufacturing. Um, this has been done over the past uh, few years as part of some funding that we have from the Department of Energy. Uh, a lot of this work was done by uh, some postdocs working with me, Sunil Kumar Kandavali and Jang Hoon Park, as well as some other collaborators at NREL. And uh, some of the work that, that I'll be showing here was also uh, performed by our collaborators at Argonne National Laboratory. And so, you know, what is a water electrolyzer? What what is a you know what are we really talking about here in terms of technology? So, um, the technology we're focusing on is known as polymer electrolyte polymer electrolyte membrane electrolysis, also sometimes termed water or low temperature electrolysis. And this is a a technique that's used to take energy to split water into hydrogen and oxygen. Uh, and so you can see here on the right, this is kind of uh, an exploded view of what a single cell in an electrolyzer looks like. We have some flow fields on the outside where we can input our water and take out our products. And then in the center of this, we have what's known as the membrane electrode assembly. And this is kind of the key component within an electrolyzer that's responsible for the electrochemical reactions that allow us to take water and split it into hydrogen and oxygen. And so the membrane electrode assembly, which is also shown over here on the left, consists of a polymer electrolyte membrane in the middle. And then on the outside of the membrane, we have two different electrodes. We have the anode, which is made of typically iridium or iridium oxide. And then on the cathode, we have platinum. And so uh, the iridium oxide is responsible for the water splitting reaction where we split water into two protons and oxygen. And on the cathode, we combine those protons that are transported across the membrane with uh, the electrons that are being supplied from our power source to make hydrogen. And so this is kind of the basic function of, of how an electrolyzer works. Um, and as I mentioned, the key component to that is kind of this, this membrane electrode assembly, which is also sometimes termed a catalyst coated membrane, which is kind of specific to the way it's made and, and the way we've looked at making it. Um, and this is really the key part of the electrolyzer. And this is the key component that we've really focused on how, how you manufacture this. And so, you know, the reason electrolyzers are important is that they're a key component to, you know, the vision of a hydrogen economy. Um, and the reason this hydrogen economy concept is very important is that hydrogen is a very useful uh, chemical can be used as an energy carrier or a storage medium, and it enables uh, very long-term storage. So it kind of can, can be used to smooth out the, the mismatch between our annual production of renewable electricity from solar and wind, with which tends to be higher in sort of the spring and fall, and the mismatch with its demand, which tends to be highest in winter and summer. Uh, we can also use it as a chemical feedstock for metals refining, uh, making synthetic fuels uh, or making ammonia. And we can use it as a transportation fuel uh, to power fuel cells that can be used to power via cars, trains, buses, boats. So uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of uses for hydrogen, especially when we can use uh, electrolyzers to produce greenhouse gas free hydrogen. And we already do have a pretty substantial hydrogen economy uh, in the US already. Annually, we produce about 10 million metric tons of hydrogen per year. Um, but it's really 
localized to being applied to ammonia synthesis and oil upgrading. So we're really sort of only focusing on kind of, you know, ammonia synthesis down here and, and upgrading of oil. So we really haven't fully realized the potential of hydrogen. Uh, and the current methodology for producing uh, hydrogen is generally from steam methane reforming, which, well, it works, it, it produces a lot of CO2, so it's not a greenhouse gas free process. So if we're trying to uh, reduce the greenhouse gas emissions of, you know, a wide variety of sectors of our economy uh, through this hydrogen economy, we need to be producing hydrogen through a gre greenhouse gas free process and uh, water electrolyzers that are powered through renewable electricity enable us to do that. And so, uh, you know, this electrolyzer is kind of the key component to really enabling uh, this vision of, of the hydrogen economy. And, you know, to sort of go further down into that vision, the DOE has set a target for hydrogen production costs lower than $2 per kilogram. And this is some work that's come out of um, the analysis group at NREL looking at the current costs of a 200 kilowatt electrolyzer stack um, and how various uh, improvements can, can drop the costs of those stacks uh, to kind of get us to this $2 per kilogram cost target. Uh, and so you can see, you know, current production is fairly expensive because at the moment, electrolytes is kind of a niche uh, product. And so, you know, they're not really leveraging a lot of economies of scale and, and um, they're not necessarily always uh, made in such a way to really minimize costs. And so, um, you know, economies of scale and improvements in manufacturing processes have the potential to really reduce the costs of hydrogen production. And you can see that here in this plot where you can see these two boxes that are highlighted with these, these red squares. You know, these are reductions in the stack manufacturing costs through improvements in manufacturing and economies of scale. And so, you know, the work we're doing and, you know, kind of the objectives are work to really push electrolyzer manufacturing to more high throughput manufacturing process can really help and go a long way to bring the costs of hydrogen down to where it really starts to become an enabling technology. Uh, and so the method for manufacturing that we're looking at is what's known as roll-to-roll -roll manufacturing. And this is an established high throughput method for production of thin films of materials with decades of industrial knowledge. You know, it's used to make scotch tape, um, lots of other polymer films, uh, you know, many products, you know, use these processes and, it, you know, um, they can be produced materials at really fast speeds, you know, tens of meters per minute. In some cases, you can go meters per second. Um, and so these really enable, you know, really high throughput and, and large production of, a, you know, a large volume of materials really quickly. <clears throat> um, and in terms of, you know, they've also, you know, they can produce really uniform materials too. So, you know, they can they should in theory be able to give, you know, highly uniform, high performance materials. However, because electrolyzers are still sort of, as I said, a niche technology, these production methodologies really haven't been applied to, uh, to make electrolyzers because the demand hasn't been there. Um, and so it's not, hasn't really been proven out that we can design, um, design a process to give us, you know, the performance we're really looking for and, and really need. Um, and so kind of the requirements for a process like this is that we need to have a stable and well-dispersed catalyst ink. So in a roll to roll process, we have a substrate, which in this case, it's shown as a, the, the polymer electrolyte membrane. And as it goes through the process, it gets coated with a liquid dispersion of the catalyst materials um, that are then dried and then form the final dried film that eventually goes into the electrolyzer. And this ink needs to be uniform and stable so that we get a very heterogeneous defect-free coating uh, that, that will perform the way we want it to. Um, the other requirement is that we have to have an ink that properly interacts with the substrate, so it needs to wet it properly, um, and you know it needs to, to be able to sort of um, adhere to it well and, and give us a nice, you know, mechanically sound coating as well. And so, you know, we're kind of focusing on these these requirements and trying to come up with a process that will um, give us an electrolyzer that performs as well as things we make in sort of slower lab scale processes, 
but with a methodology that produces things, you know, hundreds or thousands of times faster. Um, and so the, the materials that we've used in this study, we're using a standard iridium oxide catalyst, which is kind of the benchmark material, as well as a ion conducting polymer called Nafion, um, which is, and again, a, a typical sort of ion conducting polymer that's, it's a fluoropolymer and it has these sulfonic acid sites that are responsible for the proton conduction, which helps us get the protons either from the catalyst sites to the membrane or from the membrane to the catalyst sites to do the electrochemical reaction. So this, these are both key components within these catalyst layers. And to do the coating processes, uh, we take these the iridium oxide and the nafion and we disperse it in a mixture of water and one propanol or ethanol and potentially something different. But uh, in what I'm gonna present today, we'll, we'll focus just on uh, propanol and ethanol. Um, and so, you know, in, a, in our desire to make manufacturing processes more efficient, uh, we were trying to develop a roll-to-roll -roll process that reduces the number of processing steps. Um, kind of the current methodology for making electrolyzer CCMs is that you would coat the catalyst layer onto a decal or a sacrificial substrate, and then through a hot lamination step, you would transfer that catalyst layer to the membrane. And the reason this is done is that the membrane itself is prone to swelling in the water and alcohols that are in the catalyst ink, but it's a bit of a wasteful process because we have an additional process step with this lamination step, and we also have scrap material. So this decal, you know, gets used and then it has to be thrown away. Uh, so, so there's a lot of inefficiency there. And so if we're gonna make our manufacturing processes lower cost and higher throughput, it's beneficial to just go to a direct coating process where we coat the catalyst layer directly on the membrane. But that means we need to design our ink in such a way that it minimizes how much swelling there is of the membrane during coating. But we have to balance that criteria with sort of the general ink criteria that we need an ink that's stable, that's uh, well dispersed, and that's the properties that will give us a uniform coating. Uh, and so we set about to sort of tackle these two challenges. And the first, the first process was really just trying to understand what the materials are doing in the ink and how they interact with each other. Um, and so kind of the questions we were asking was, how do we make a good ink and how do we make a good coating? Um, and so within the inks, you know, the questions we want to understand are, are the inner particle forces attractive or they're repulsive? Um, if they're attractive, those will tend to lead towards the particles agglomerating together. And if they get big enough due to gravity, they'll start to sediment out, which is not desirable for, a, you know, sort of a large scale coating process. And then if we can understand these interactions, how does changing the ink formulation change the interaction and stability? And can we, you know, come up with a rational way to think about these inks and, and design them in a way such that we can get, you know, uh, hom homogeneous and stable dispersions? And then in, in the coating processes, you know, we have to have an ink that wets the substrate, it has to dry well to give us a uniform film. And so we kind of have to, again, as I said earlier, balance these, these different criteria to give us a final product that performs the way we want it to. So we first, um, we first started out trying to understand the forces within the catalyst dispersions. And so uh, we first started just looking at what the behavior of the iridium oxide catalyst was. And so we looked just at dispersions of catalyst in water and one propanol, but it had no ionomer. So we're just looking at the attractive or repulsive forces between the particles themselves. Um, so we did some steady shear rheology on these dispersions because we found that rheology is a really useful tool for us to study agglomeration behavior in particulate dispersions because it can be very sensitive to the way the particles are interacting with each other. And so if you have particles that are well dispersed and they spread out, the total volume fraction of solids in your dispersion is just the sum of the volume fraction of the individual particles. And the reason this matters is that the viscosity of your ink is dependent on the volume fraction of solids in your ink. But if we have a case where we have an agglomerated dispersion where the individual particles cluster together, the effective volume fraction of solids in the ink is not just the sum of the volume of individual particles, but when they, these particles together, 
they immobilize some of the liquid in the interstitial spaces between particles. This entrained liquid to the total effective volume fraction of solids, which increases the uh, uh, of these ions. So in these iridium oxide-based inks, though, because these agglomerates are only weakly bound together, they're not covalently bound, if you apply shear forces, you can break these agglomerates apart back down into these, you know, more well dispersed particles under the shear force under shear forces, and you can see a drop in viscosity with increasing shear force. And that's exactly what we see here in this rheology. So if you look at you know these curves up here where we have higher concentrations, they show this very characteristic shear thinning behavior of a weakly agglomerated system, um, where at low shear rates we have iridium oxide particles that are clustered together. And as we apply more uh, shear force in our rheometer, we break them down into kind of the well dispersed individual particles. And so, you know, this tells us that the catalyst particles in the absence of ionomer are weakly agglomerated. Um, and so we need to make sure we have inks that where we can use the ionomer or the ink properties to disperse these particles so that we get a nice well dispersed catalyst ink. And so we wanted to, to, to you know, understand at kind of a more foundational level how the ionomer and the catalyst particles were interacting um, in a very dilute ink so we can kind of isolate the effects of interparticular interactions and not be so worried about sort of more macro scale, uh, you know, interactions in, in more concentrated solutions that we'd actually use for coating. So these are very dilute inks, um, but they're quite useful to understand what's going on in these inks. And so using dynamic light scattering, we can look at the effective uh, particle size of the iridium oxide particles as we add different amounts of ionomer. And what you can see is that as we add increasing amounts of ionomer, the, the average particle size increases. And what this is telling us is that, or what it, what it seems to indicate is that the ionomer is absorbing onto the surface of the iridium oxide particles. Um, and that's, that's sort of increasing, increasing the effective particle size. We can also use um, zeta potential measurements to study this absorption behavior as well. So the zeta potential measures the effective surface potential of a particle in a dispersion. And so without an ionomer, uh, the iridium oxide particles have a zeta potential a little bit a shy of negative 20 millivolts. And because this is not a very large zeta potential, this is this explains why they tend to agglomerate. So, you know, this is a reasonably small zeta potential. And so the electrostatic repulsion of the bare iridium oxide particles is not that strong. So the attractive van der Waals forces cause them to agglomerate, which is what we saw on the previous slide in the steady shear rheology data. And when we add ionomer, we see that the zeta potential becomes more negative. And this, you know, consistent with the dynamic light scattering data indicates that the ionomer is adsorbing onto the particle surface because the ionomer is negatively charged. It's an anionic polymer. Um, and so as we add more polymer to the surface of the particles, we see a consistent decrease in the zeta potential, which uh, you know, indicates that the, the ionomer is, is adsorbing onto the, the particle surface consistent with DLS data. We wanted to make sure though that what we were, this effect we were seeing here was really due to the ionomer and was not due to the polymer changing the pH of um, the dispersion and the more acidic pH of the dispersion with more ionomer making, changing the surface potential of the, of the particles. And so we looked at just the pH effects on the particle zeta potential with no ionomer by adding sulfuric acid to our dispersions. And you can see as we increase or decrease the pH and make things more acidic, which would represent adding more ionomer, in, in this case, we actually see the zeta potential becomes more positive. So this very conclusively shows now that this zeta potential uh, data we have here is in fact the ionomer adsorbing on the particle surface. And so because we have polymer adsorbing on the particle surface and making the surface potential more negative, we should have more electrostatic repulsion. And also um, the polymer itself should provide some steric repulsion to prevent the iridium oxide particles from agglomerating. And that's what we see in these sort of very simple stability studies where we take 
we made two different dispersions, one with no ionomer and one with a little bit of ion with some more ionomer and let them sit for 16 hours. And you can see without ionomer, in the case where we have very little stability, all of the particles agglomerate and sediment out. And in the case where we have ionomer, which is providing this uh, electrostatic and steric stabilization of the particles, we get a much more stable dispersion. So, you know, this was for a single ink formulation, but what it shows is that we can, if we have the right properties of our inks, the inks can be quite stable and they can be quite well dispersed, which is what we want for coating. Um, and so if we now, if we move towards more concentrated dispersions, we see that the same things play out in an ink concentration that would be reminiscent or reflective of what we would actually use in a real coating. So now we're, we, we've moved up to 35 weight percent ionomer in the dispersion and we're looking at uh, different relative amounts of ionomer. And you can see, you know, kind of at the lower amounts of ionomer, these show Newtonian rheology, which is very different than the shear thinning rheology of the iridium oxide dispersion without ionomer. And this is reflective of the fact that we've stabilized these particles uh, and they're not agglomerating. And so we can see this too in some X-ray scattering data that we did. So this is ultra small angle and small, X, small angle X-ray scattering data that we took at Argonne National Laboratory. And we can use this to study what the sizes of the structures in these catalyst inks are. And so here we're looking at the radius of gyration of the catalyst particles as well as the fractal dimension, which is an indicator of how many sort of really large scale agglomerates we have in these inks. And so um, you can see that when we add just a little bit of ionomer, we have a significant decrease in the radius of gyration as well as this fractal dimension, both of which indicate that we've significantly stabilized these iridium oxide particles against agglomeration, which you can see more clearly here in the particle size distribution of these inks that is generated from from this data up here. And so you can see without an ionomer, we have a lot of particles above a thousand nanometers. Whereas when we add some ionomer now, you know, we, we don't really have any particles that are larger than 300 nanometers. And so you can see that we, you know, we've been effective, we've effectively been able to stabilize the iridium oxide particles against agglomeration. And so now that we kind of understood how to, uh, you know, studied these inks and kind of knew what the interactions were, we shifted our focus a little bit towards looking at how we designed an ink that minimized the membrane swelling so that when we wanted to coat directly on the membrane, um, we didn't have to deal with these swelling problems that could make tensioning and, and other things challenging. And so what we did was we took droplets of different mixtures of water and, and propanol or water and ethanol and put them on a membrane to see how quickly they absorbed into the membrane. And that's shown here in these pictures for different ratios of water and propanol. It's also shown in these plots over here for water and er, and propanol and ethanol. And so you can see for things that are really rich in water, like this 100% water case or this 90% water case, we don't really see much change in the contact angle, which means we're not really absorbing that much uh, of that much liquid over sort of this 200 second time scale. But for this 50-50 case of water and propanol, we see that within 50 seconds, it's almost all absorbed into the membrane. And that's seen by this really rapid drop in the contact angle to about this point where we can't even measure it anymore. Um, but for ethanol, we don't see the same behavior. They all sort of show this you know, very gradual decrease. So they're, really, they're not really being that rapidly absorbed into the membrane. So this indicated to us that, that ethanol might be a better alcohol to use in our catalyst ink dispersions from a membrane interaction standpoint. But we wanted to make sure that it actually still worked from an ink formulation standpoint. So we formulated different inks with uh, n-propanol and ethanol and studied the rheology to see if they were giving us, you know, nice, well-dispersed catalyst inks. Uh, and you can see in the n-propanol case, for the most part, most of these inks are Newtonian, indicating we have, you know, very good, well-dispersed catalyst inks. In this 1910 case, we see a little bit of shear thinning behavior indicating that we do have some agglomeration. And you can kind of see this here in these, these optical microscope images of some catalyst layers that we coded. You can see these kind of little spots here from these agglomerates of, of the catalyst particles. Whereas in the ethanol case, we see a lot stronger shear thinning behavior than we did 
in the n-propanol case. And, and you can see this, again, it, it bears itself out in these images of the catalyst layers. You can see these large clusters of catalyst within these inks. So, you know, this, this said, okay, well, even though ethanol might be a good choice from minimizing swelling in the membrane, it's really not a good choice from a standpoint of making a good catalyst dispersion for our ink. So we, when we actually went to do the roll tool coating, we decided it was best to stick with one propanol because that was giving us more uh, homogeneous dispersions and they should give us better coatings. So there's the final step using our roll tool coder, we coated uh, the catalyst layers onto the membranes. And that's what's being shown here. If you look at um, these microscope images, you can see that we're getting fairly uh, homogeneous uniform catalyst layer coatings. And then when we test these, these catalyst layers in our electrolyzer cells and compare them to our, our lab scale coating method, which is ultrasonic spraying, which is, gives very nice uniform catalyst layers, but it's quite slow. Um, you can see we get very similar performance between our roll to roll coated catalyst layers in black and red to our, our lab scale coated catalyst layer in blue. And so, you know, this was very encouraging for us because, you know, through, you know, sort of understanding how to design the inks and how to minimize interactions and swelling with the membrane, we were able to come up with a process where we could get something, we could get catalyst layers that produced electrolyzers that performed just the same as things we would make through sort of a conventional slow lab scale process, but we were making things, you know, hundreds of times faster. Um, and so, you know, this was very, very exciting for us. Um, and, and it, you know, it, it, it demonstrates that these large scale production methods should be able to produce electrolyzers for, you know, a hydrogen economy. And so to wrap this up, um, you know, I've, I've showed that rheology is a really useful tool for us to study agglomeration behavior in these catalyst inks, and that by varying our dispersion media, we can change the agglomeration behavior of the catalyst particles. And that by tuning this agglomeration, we can, we can make uniform catalyst layers that give us good performance. And then, and then finally, I showed uh, that our roll to roll coded catalyst layers perform as well as our lab scale catalyst layers, but they're produced you know, with orders of magnitude increase in production rate. Uh, and then, you know, and that this should be sort of enabling for large scale electrolyzer production for the hydrogen economy. So thank you for your time um, and have a good day.